Well, hello everybody and welcome back. Um, this, is, this video here is actually kind of a take two of this video because I started doing this one and uh, things got really busy at work and kind of the, the little the parts that, that I filmed of this were kind of jumbled up and just didn't have good flow to it. So I erased and we're starting over again. So I have done a little bit of work on this, but not much. So we're going to start this one over and uh, hopefully make a little more sense of the video. What you see before you is a actually as huge as this thing is, and you can see here's my hand. <laughs> it is a gigantic device, but it is just an AM FM tuner. And uh, some of you who are really into high-end uh, vintage audio equipment may recognize this, um, but it is the Sansui TUX1 AM FM stereo tuner and uh, sometimes it's just it's referred to as a uh, a broadcast communications monitor um, just fancy words that basically say that you know radio stations and commercial uh, radio may have used this device or would use these devices uh, for monitoring their broadcast of their radio stations. So this is a very high-end tuner is what it is. It's very unique and I will admit this is the first time I've ever seen one in in real life let alone have worked on one. But uh, right off the bat you'll notice some things that that are kind of different from any other kind of just commercial grade, you know, stereo tuner that's out there. Um, the first thing that you'll notice is that there's two separate tuning knobs, uh, one for the AM section and one for the FM section. And the reason for that is that this is actually like having two tuners in one case. In other words, unlike a lot of the tuners that are out there, uh, for instance, um, we worked on a Pioneer Model F28 and we looked at a Model F26 and those tuners are FM only tuners. Uh, we did a whole bunch of other tuners and they were AM and FM combination. We've done a lot of receivers that had AM and FM but they share a lot of common circuitry. This is a little bit different in that there are two individual chassis inside of this one that is specifically dedicated to the FM and the stereo section and the other one that's dedicated strictly to the AM section and really the only thing that these these two tuners share in common other than the same they're in the same case is they do share a common power supply um, when you look at the front panel you can see you have individual strength multipath and tuning centering meters for the FM section and separate meet, tuning and strength meters for the AM section on this side. Um, each tuner has its own wide and narrow IF band so you have uh, adjustable bandwidth for your IF section. They both have muting. Um, the AM tuner actually has a beat canceller and it has upper and lower uh, frequency beat canceller and when the the little bit of you know that I've tried this out what I found is the AM tuner almost acts like uh, similar to you know my a ham radio receiver in that it picks up all the little birdies and you can kinda hear as you zoom in on a channel you can kinda hear the side bands and things and again I don't know again I'm still working with this, but it's definitely unique and different from any other AM tuner that I've ever worked on as far as you know, broadcast receivers like this. The other thing is you have two separate preamps built into this thing, um, output one and output two, and I, you can assign either of these variable outputs to either the AM or the FM tuner section just by selecting which one you want to go to which. So theoretically I can tune in and you, I could set this one to output the AM and this one to output the FM and I can tune an AM station in and have it go in, come out of here and go into one amplifier and I can tune an FM station in simultaneously and have it output 
on the channel too or i can have them you know one one am or fm on both coming out at the same time uh, the fm meter the, it has a built-in multi-path meter but it does so much more than that when we look at the back of the tuner um, let me flip this thing around and kind of show you the back side of it now when you look at the rear of the tuner the first thing you notice is this and it's hinged it folds down this great big thing is the AM bar antenna this is a serious antenna um, very impressive so you can see this is not your average tuner that you see um, for the antenna inputs if I show you here you have your FM 300 ohm which is standard we see that all the time we have the 75 ohm coax input and then we have our AM antenna input and ground okay for your unbalanced just your so you can hook up just a basic long wire antenna if you want then you see this other strange looking jack right here called the it says for FA-7 FA7 and if you look there's a little plunger here that when you screw the F connector onto this the the housing of the F connector actually pushes this little plunger in and this plunger is connected inside to a little switch to a little slide switch a little momentary slide switch and what this is for is when Sansui designed this tuner um, they also designed a specific out, outside external antenna for it called the FA7 and it's a kind of a directional antenna from what I've seen and I'll, if I can find a picture I'll get it up there but it's I believe it is even more rare than this tuner is itself these are pretty rare as you can tell um, and it's supposed to increase the sensitivity because the, the, the antenna was specifically cut and designed uh, for this tuner and it tunes in AM as well as FM so it has you know it has an FM element and an AM element and it screws right into here and when this plunger switch pushes in it activates that jack and this is kind of tied into part of the 300 ohm input section right here it's kind of a like I said very unique um, there's a multipath output right here for your vertical and horizontal uh, input of an oscilloscope so you can actually connect this to an actual oscilloscope which I did it's very interesting or you can you know there were m monitor scopes um, that you could purchase I, I know Pioneer has one probably Sansui has one I haven't looked it up but you could connect this to it to look at the multipath signal um, it also has an IF output for stereo AM it has the FM discriminator output which is essentially you're just going to see the modulation stripped off of the carrier wave out of here so if I wanted to connect this to an oscilloscope uh, to the vertical input of an oscilloscope you can actually look at your audio it, it just allows you to visualize the audio on your FM it has a separate FM output and it's fixed it's not a variable variable output it's just a fixed level output but it has Dolby FM de-emphasis so this is actually Dolby FM okay Dolby used a special FM de-emphasis which I don't think is being used anymore anywhere um, correct me if I'm wrong guys I'm not a, you know up to date on this stuff I really <laughs> so <laughs> help me out here on some of this but this has a Dolby output and I know uh, the Sansui 9090 DB the uh, the realistic STA 2100 D or the 2000 D those all had Dolby FM built in that was a common thing in the early 80s so this is this is what that's for in addition to the discrete output 1 and output 2 that can be assigned to either the FM or the AM tuner section. This is a universal amplifier uh, device that can work uh, on multi voltages. It originally came from Europe and it was originally wired for 220 volts. And really, by taking this little 
cap off this little cover there's just a little jumper plug and you can set it for any voltage from 100 volts to 120 volts to 220 to 240 so there's four different uh, voltages voltage ranges that this will run on so one of the first things I had to do is this had this had come with a uh, a European plug on it and it was wired for 240 so I rewired it for 120 I'm going to change the jumper and I just put in a standard uh, power cord for here and changed the fuse from a half amp fuse which is what it had with it to the one amp fuse you need for 120 volt operation um, this was sent to me by a friend of mine who is a very avid collector of really high-end audio equipment he had been looking for one of these for a long time um, these are hard to come by and when you do come by them they're very very expensive these were extraordinarily expensive in their day when they were new um, again this wasn't just meant to be a tuner that you'd put in your living room even though it worked very well for that but this actually was professional grade that uh, to my understanding much like uh, I believe uh, Fisher had the uh, FM 1000 or something like that they called it um, these were used by radio stations to monitor their own broadcast because it's that high end um, the, the the frequency range and so forth especially in the AM you're gonna find out is really exceptional um, some of the, the way that you can reject noise in an AM, uh, the AM tuner on this is phenomenal. I just, I've never seen anything like it when I, when I tested it out. Um, so hopefully we'll get to see that. Again, uh, this is take two of the, of my video. Cause like I said, the first one was just all chopped up. Work has been really busy for, for us. We have multiple jobs going on at the same time. And I really haven't had enough time to really pay attention to this. So I thought I'd start over again, kind of catch you all up. And uh, where we're at right now is I have tested it. It does work. Um, everything seems to be perfect in this, with the exception of the AM tuning center meter doesn't seem to work hardly at all uh, the signal strength meter works but the tuning meter does not work and I don't know if that's just normal or you know I've tried feeding signals into it I've tried just tuning in signals you know just regular stations this just doesn't seem to have much of any effect so we're gonna look into that uh, when I took this apart originally the cover for the FM tuning gang was put on backwards and upside down. So it tells me somebody was in here. Um, and although the FM sensitivity first check seems to be very good, um, I, I'm afraid that possibly <laughs> the, uh, the golden, the grim tweakers, <laughs> the, the grim tweaker reaper, <laughs> say that five times fast, was in there with his golden tweaker and uh, making some adjustments in here I think I don't know but we're going to uh, where we're gonna pick up now is I'm gonna take the cover off for you I'm gonna show you around the inside a little bit of this and then we're gonna attempt to just kinda go through the alignment process on this and spot check it um, again we're just gonna kinda roughly go through it the alignment process on this is actually very straightforward uh, unlike like that F28 that I did, um, which had a relatively, you know, complicated alignment procedure. Same thing as the TX9800 video that we did. This one is a lot more straightforward. It's it just seems to me to make more sense. It's just, you know, a lot easier the way they made it. So we're going to go through that and check and see how this works. And if we have a problem with the AM, we'll try to troubleshoot it and get it working and get this thing up to top shape. So let's get the cover off and let's look around the inside a little bit. Okay, we have the cover off on this thing and I did find a little bit of information here for you that I'll share with you. Um, this is a very hard printout to see, but if you look, and I'll try to see if I can get a digital copy of this and kind of put it up on the video when I edit it. But this strange looking thing, like it's floating out in outer space from 2001 A Space Odyssey, is actually uh, that FA7 antenna assembly. 
and again it's not a very good picture and I'm not really sure um, you know how how it's I think it's only just a portion of the antenna that you're seeing but you can kind of see it's got these two elements here two elements here looks like there's another element in the back and then I don't know what this is if this is just a something in the picture in the image that's distorted or if that's another element or a suspension that it hangs from or what but uh, that's kind of what the antenna looks like um, if you look at the spec sheet on this, it's very impressive. And I'll just kind of run some of this by you so you can, and if you want to pause the video and kind of study this, you can. I'll just slowly move it along here so you can see all of the features of this thing. So there you go. And again, if you want to just pause the video and look at some of this, you can. Feel free to do that. But uh, the sensitivity on this thing and the frequency response and everything is exceptional. So <clears throat> when, uh, when I took this apart, and this top half, when you take the top cover off, this whole section up here is your FM section. So this, in and of itself, is just an FM tuner. And this cover here for the tuning gang was actually flipped over upside down and backwards. And so I know somebody had had it off and was doing something in here. Um, I don't know about the AM section, though. The capacitors are super high quality. They're all Nichicon and Elna. Uh, there is none of that glue used anywhere in this amplifier, so it's totally clean. Uh, there's a little tiny bit of surface dust, and this is how I received it. Um, and it did come from Europe. Um, so it's, it's very clean. And you can see it's relatively simple. You have this board, you know, these couple of boards here. Yeah, and you have your... Uh, you know your front end FM front end that has your RF section in it your RF amplifier and so forth but really there's not much to it when you look at it but it's very well built and very very efficient design I mean I love when I looked at the schematics I really really like the design when I saw it now this whole thing is made to come out as a module if you notice this upper chassis tray here has just a couple of screws these are just RCA plugs that can be taken out. There's a little coupling right here that will decouple the whole tuning assembly. So the flywheel, the dial cord, everything stays intact. And just by decoupling this little coupling unit, we can remove the whole FM tuner as an assembly to service it. And on the other side of this rail, upside down, is another tray just like this one and it contains the power supply and the AM tuner section and once again it has a coupling if you look down in here you can see right here am I am I pointing to it here we go right here is the flywheel for the FM tuner and right here is the flywheel for the AM tuner and each one has their own separate set of dial cords and their own separate dial indicators. And there's your meters on this, meters on this side for the FM, meters for the AM. Everything comes apart and can be removed to service. So it's very, very service friendly. So as complex of a receiver as this is, it's also very service friendly. Um, let's flip it over and look at the underside. Okay, I really had to move the camera back just to get the whole thing in the shot because uh, how big this thing is. But uh, hopefully this gives you an idea of how, uh, of what this thing looks like. Now if we pan down to the bottom here, I'll move you down. This is your power supply section. And it's just a little transformer because obviously it's a tuner. It doesn't really draw a whole lot of current. Um, right here is all the wires for that universal power transformer so and here's all the jumper plugs and the jumper plug on the opposite side is what selects 
the combination of wires to change your input incoming mains voltage uh, range so depending on what mains you have that's how you do it um, so we just put a new cord in here no problem and here's your power supply down here and it's regulated very very quiet um, very well designed power supply looking at the schematics and we'll get into some schematics here a little bit later and then this great big board here is your AM tuner and you can see that great big tuning gang is just for the AM section only and again just like the other chassis on the top for the FM you have the this decoupling this coupler here that we can take off we can take these screws out and this whole thing has plugs and the whole thing can just come right out to service it uh, the really unique thing is your input board for the antenna which is right here let me zoom you in a little bit on that and you can see that switch I was talking about that's connected to that little plunger on the F connector as you screw that in and this whole thing you can see it has its own alignment for that FA7 antenna so this is this is this whole circuit is dedicated to that and you can see it ties into the AM tuning gang and then there's wires that also go over to the FM tuning gang as well so uh, this is like I said very very serious <laughs> tuner um, when you look at all the all the filters and everything that they use on this thing uh, this AM tuner again is I bet it's going to be excellent so we're going to mess with it a little bit but uh, again I'm hoping the Grim Tweaker Reaper was not on this thing and got it totally out of whack uh, the tuning does seem a little bit different from when I'm used to seeing an AM tuner but uh, the jury is still out I, I don't know if that's because somebody's tried to align it um, it doesn't really look like anybody has messed with it even though I did see signs that people were in here but uh, you know looking at the all the adjustments they don't really look like they've been tampered with a whole lot but we'll have to find out so there it is there's the nickel tour of this tuner here is you could see how complex the dial cord is if that dial cord ever broke um, I'm sure we could get it back on but man I think that would be really difficult uh, especially you look at these little tensioning wheels they kind of float they have little springs on them so that keeps tension on the the wire or on the uh, dial cord without keeping too much tension on the dial cord so you know that that's kind of neat so even if the dial cord should stretch a little bit you have a little bit of adjustment there with these springs with these tension wheels so uh, they really kind of thought of everything when they were when they designed this uh, recap am I going to recap it um, maybe maybe not um, this is a little bit later than some of the early 70s equipment that I work on uh, the caps are really well-known name brand and they're high quality there's none of that glue being used uh, I don't think this is a high hours unit it doesn't look like it has been used very much at all um, this thing is pristine condition I mean as far as an example of this goes other than a little bend in the one side of the one cover um, I don't see anything not a blemish on this machine so I don't think it has very much use and uh, when I turned it on everything seemed to work flawlessly other than like I said there's some weird alignment things going on with the AM section that just could be me <laughs> not knowing the unit yet so we're going to uh, flip this back over we're going to look at the uh, alignment procedure on this and a little bit about the design and we're going to see what we can do um, just checking the alignment pretty much okay I have the tuner connected up to a uh, amplifier to our KP500 that we modified and uh, 
I'm just using the bar antenna so I don't I'm in the basement at the bottom of a hill where I live um, in the worst possible radio environment for AM and so the fact that you can receive anything at all down here is amazing if you can get something um, and just trying to prove a point so I tuned in there's a local channel that is a very very high power AM station and it's probably about uh, 35 miles away from where I live and uh, I have it tuned in and I'm just gonna kinda demonstrate some of the features of the AM section of this we'll get into the FM here in a minute so so you can hear this tuner and it's it's noisy because of the conditions that we're in and again I'm on the bench with all the noisy equipment and so forth but let's look at some of these controls so the first thing we're going to look at is the the IF band wide and narrow we're set to wide now we're going to switch to narrow I would be very disappointed. You hear that? Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. All right. So you think Urban's got to go? A manual right there. But you're a man of standards in all seriousness. It doesn't matter the job performance if you're not a. And then here's our beat canceler. That bothers the manual. We'll be back. So you hear how much static there is right now? When it comes Watch to this. How do you make sense of it all? Tune into Financial Engines Investing Sense every Saturday morning at 11 or visit investingsense.com. So you can hear. So it kind of gives you the idea of how, how much control you have over this for reducing noise and so forth. Um, obviously, there's a trade off in high frequency response and so forth, but by adjusting that, you can actually get an intelligible signal. Um, for listening to a, a DX channel. Uh, now here's the weird thing when you tune this in. When I, t when I tune this around it kind of almost acts like um, a TRF or a, a tuned radio frequency receiver. It's kind of strange how it tunes where you can actually hear when you're coming in on the sidebands how it'll howl and squeal. I'll demonstrate that. I'll tune off channel and then we'll tune back on. News Radio 570 W. From ABC News. Berg, the motive behind the worst mass shooting in modern day U.S. history will so be there you go. as police close the investigation. So there you go. Um, you can see how like you can hear the sidebands and so forth as you tune in. And again, I'm not sure. I mean, as as high of a squeal as that is, I don't. I'm not so sure that that's normal for this. So that's one of the reasons that I'm a little skeptical. The other thing I noticed is, as you can see, that the AM signal strength uh, will go up and down. Let me reposition the camera so you can see that. Okay, now you can see the signal strength in here, I hope, and as I tune, and you can see, I can kind of see when I'm there, but when you look at the tuning, plus and minus, it really hardly even moves at all. You can see it deflect a little bit, but not much. So. I don't believe that the, the AM section is working properly. Again, I could be wrong, but uh, that's one of the reasons that I want to check the alignment on the AM section. The FM seems to be working very well, and uh, let me connect up and we'll tune through a couple channels on that, and I'll demonstrate that. Okay, to connect to uh, get onto the FM, all we do is switch over to FM here to our output. And now we can tune. I have my outside antenna connected for FM. And uh, we're just going to go down the dial. And now we use this knob and this tuning indicator. China announced retaliatory tariffs on another $60 billion worth of U.S. goods, including coffee, honey, and... and you can kind of see when I go off-channel. 
and then when I kick it into stereo mode, how staticky it gets. Now, and I can go to mono mode. So there's mono. There's stereo. The other thing I noticed is the wide and narrow IF band has uh, doesn't have very much effect on the FM as much as it does on the AM. So when I turn that on and off, there's narrow band, wide band. And that could be an alignment issue or a problem or that may be just the way it is. Now you can see over here when I switch back and forth, you could see the lights change down here, but it makes no difference in the sound. And the day at sixty-eight dollars forty-nine cents a barrel on the New York Mercantile Exchange. And again, Wall Street higher by the closing bell. The dollar more than. And you can see it tunes right in. It snaps right in. The sensitivity on this tuner is, you know, this one, this is working. It's working really well. But it seems to, uh, I just, the only thing I don't notice is any difference at all between wide and narrow band. And it doesn't seem to be a uh, matter whether it's a weak station or a strong station. I tried connecting this to the signal generator, injecting known uh, signal levels, and it, the, the wide and narrow basically has no effect at high frequencies or low frequencies. So um, that might be something we need to look at, or it could be something that was, you know, played with in the alignment. I don't really know because I haven't really gone through any of that. But as you can see, it works really well. And um, the sound quality on this thing is exceptional. Um, of course, I can't really demonstrate that with a camera and a... And a uh, you know, in a vocal microphone facing the wrong way, but uh, take my word for it. Maybe I'll do some recording. Um, I'll get a good station in when we're all done, and maybe I'll try to record a clip uh, directly into the, uh, you know, into the computer and capture it and upload it, but uh, just to give you an idea of the performance. But this thing does work really well. So there you have it. It uh, we have a couple little things we want to check and I think the best way to test something like this is just by going through the alignment and following the uh, the procedure for the alignment and I think if something is wrong we'll catch it during the alignment and then we can troubleshoot it and repair it from there so if that sounds interesting uh, stick with me and that's uh, what we'll do another thing I wanted to bring up here real quick uh, if you didn't already notice is the band spread of the AM section if you look at the amount of movement of the tuning dial from 530 to 600 kilohertz just to go that 70 kilohertz you have this much movement of the dial and you can see it compresses a little bit tighter as you go up the scale so at the higher frequencies that you know the channels are are a little bit tighter together on the you know on the tuning gang so you can see from here, there's a 200, 200 kilohertz jump from here to here in just this little tiny space here, whereas it's only a 70 kilohertz jump for this big wide space down here. They did that on purpose because of how the way that the band is split up and how the, how the tuning selectivity works as you go up the dial. So uh, I thought that was really interesting also to, sh you know, how clearly you can see that on this. So, uh, all right, let's get back to it. All right, as I said earlier, here's the, the whole alignment procedure for the entire unit. And it's only three pages, and it's split up based on the section. So you have one page for the FM tuner alignment, one part for the multiplex or FM stereo alignment, and the last page is for the AM alignment. So that's really, like I said, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, test equipment wise, they're asking um, for the FM, they're talking about using a genoscope. And I think we've talked about genoscopes in, uh, on some previous videos that I did. A genoscope is simply a piece of test equipment that, you know, was er came out earlier. And it's essentially a signal generator and an oscilloscope 
all in one unit so it's kind of compacts that down rather than having you know discrete test equipment on your bench you would buy this unit and it it took care of all your needs for aligning <laughs> uh, you know tuners and so forth so Sansui was big on the use of the genoscope that doesn't matter we can actually still just use our oscilloscope and our signal generator and we can do the same thing um, they're showing you here how they want you to connect uh, your uh, test equipment into this and they want you to measure you know basic equipment VTVM for signal strength uh, your distortion meter and and then an oscilloscope here um, they're showing you here an audio oscillator and your multiplex and you're switching between them and modulating your signal generator that's all they're showing here and then going into your antenna um, no, nothing nothing too complicated and that's how we're gonna do it so uh, I'm just gonna check the FM first and get it out of the way because I have a feeling it's going to be pretty spot on and uh, and then we'll go and we'll look at the AM last okay we have our little setup here and a um, couple things as I say in all my videos when we're doing tuner alignment you have to modify the procedure to the test equipment that you have um, and again they're using that genoscope and the genoscope for the IF sweep uh, signal output has a lot higher output level um, than my test equipment has so when I use the the attenuator and uh, detector probe that that they have you build my signal the signal just isn't substantial enough through my oscilloscope to really get a good image so what I'm using instead is I'm just using a standard uh, RF detector probe and these can be purchased you know you can get them online but uh, you can make one also I have a homemade one that I have as well and it's just it's a detector probe it has the diodes built into it and so forth it's very similar to the little circuit it's just that the capacitors and resistors are going to be a little different but in general it will work I'm then everything else is the same I'm still using the 100 picofarad capacitor to feed the signal in to the test point that they recommend and they very conveniently you know leave all the holes right to get to all the test points and everything without having to remove the covers so that the noise and level and so forth can stay the same because if you adjust these with the covers off a lot of times it will change the, cap the internal capacitance and so forth it will cause it to be off off alignment when you put the cover back on so this is really nice the way they do it um, the waveform that they show let me see if I can find what I did with my test my instruction sheet here the waveform that they show they're actually showing this kind of a, a waveform and they're kind of trying I think they're trying to show the little markers and I do have markers on there but I can't really pick them up because again my drive signal is not high enough not important for this particular thing so this is what the signal looks like with my setup and for what we need to do it will work just fine so first thing we're going to adjust is the the four transformers and we're adjusting the wide band, IF bandwidth to peak it out and um, you'll see how it adjusts and I, I have a feeling they're completely perfectly spot on but we're gonna check anyway so there's four little IF transformers let me get on the first one all right and let me zoom you in a little bit so you can see a little better what the waveform looks like and get the okay and here we go so that's the wrong way there's peak there's back and now I'm passed through it so right there's our first peak and it was right on so I have a feeling they're all gonna be like this that's down once again that one was peaked Let's try our third one yep right on 
and the fourth one. Okay. And then on this other board, they just want us to ad adjust. There's a little transformer for this board as well. And it was spot on. So everything is right on with this. So now let's look at the narrow uh, adjustment for the narrow bandwidth. Okay, everything stays the same. And the only change that we make to our setup is the by just to select the narrow bandwidth. So watch what happens. And you can see the amplitude drops a little bit. Um, let me get a little better focused here. The amplitude drops a little bit from wide to narrow, as to be expected. And we just adjust this other little can here. And that one was off. You can see there. Now if we switch back and forth, okay, nice. So yeah, that one was off a little bit. Okay, looks good. Okay, so that part is done, and uh, we're going to move on to the next part. Okay, folks, we're going to do this clip a second time because I did not hit the record button on the first take. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, anyway, for those of you who are really into the grammar thing, I get corrected on my grammar all the time. Newsflash, I am not a grammar major nor do I ever claim to be one. I apologize for those of you who are insulted by my poor grammar, and I do uh, relate to that, but unfortunately, just the way it is. So, I will try my best. My apologies. Anyways, um, we're connected to test point zero two, which is your discriminator output. Um, you really, when you adjust the discriminator on a receiver, you really want to short out or ground the input terminal to the antenna so that it doesn't pick up any spurious noise or anything like that because it's, it can throw off your results. The other thing unique about this tuner is most FM discriminators, when you do the alignment, they usually tell you to adjust for zero volts. So you want it to be nulled out. Um, on this particular receiver, they're actually asking for you to use uh, to set it to somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.15 or between 100 millivolts and 150 millivolts so you're kind of offsetting it a little bit from zero um, I don't know why because I really didn't read uh, didn't look at the schematics or anything to figure out why they want it that way but that's the way they ask for it um, now, we're going to use a little different piece of test equipment here. Right here, uh, I just picked this up a couple of months ago. And it is an HP Model 410C voltmeter. They, a lot of times, refer to this as a VTVM, vacuum tube voltmeter. But realistically, this particular model does not have any tubes in it, uh, save for the tube inside this probe this is an RF probe it's for checking RF AC energy and it has a little vacuum tube in there and it can accurately lead or somewhat accurately read uh, RF voltages clear up to about 700 megahertz so this is a really neat uh, thing for checking RF but it also has a very very sensitive uh, volt and ohm meter section in it uh, I purchased this one online from an individual who specializes in these, in restoring them. He modifies uh, some of the circuitry in here and actually improves on the accuracy and uh, does a really nice, I mean this thing's like brand spanking new inside. I was really impressed. So uh, thought we'd give this one a shot. Once again, I like to use different test equipment for all of you. Uh, so that you can kind of see different techniques for, for working on some of these things. Um, you could also use a digital voltmeter. It would work just fine. Um, so we're just going to uh, use this for 
demonstration and uh, as you can see since I did this once already and I'm redoing this video <laughs> uh, we're pretty close to being aligned right now uh, when I just to kind of cover what we missed because um, I didn't push the record button uh, it was down here we're, we're on the uh, 150 millivolt scale and I want to have somewhere a little over 100 millivolts so uh, right when I first connected it up it was a little bit low it was only down around 20 millivolts or a little lower than 20 millivolts uh, so we're going or actually it was no it was 40 millivolts 40 millivolts if I recall so we're going to adjust this just a little bit so you can see what it does and of course I turned it the wrong way <laughs> The 50-50-90 rule always applies to me, whether you have figured that out or not. Do you all know what the 50-50-90 rule is? If there's a 50-50 chance of something happening, 90% of the time, I'll get the wrong 50. <laughs> so, let's adjust it. So right around there, kind of look just kind of roughly in the middle of that adjustment range. They want between 100 and 150 millivolts. So we just kind of split the difference. And our discriminator is set. So that's where we're going to leave it. And uh, that's adjusted. So now we're going to go and look at our S-curve next. Okay, we are now ready to do our S-curve. And you can see that we're connected to the same test point and but now we're actually feeding a signal into the RF section of the receiver and we're using uh, just we're using your basic 10.7 megahertz IF with uh, sweep and markers and up on the scope it was a little bit tricky I had to use my delayed sweep to get it to look halfway decent uh, so we have delayed sweep set up and you can see our S curve and I can tell right now looking at it it's probably gonna be about as good as it's gonna be um, so so far like I said very 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 close uh, alignment on this I've barely had to I, really the things that we've done probably won't make a very huge appreciable difference in the performance of the receiver um, you know it's it just it, it was very very close to begin with so Let's, uh, let's look at our S-curve and let's see if we can adjust it. And the idea is you want it to be symmetrical and you want it to be um, as steep as possible and linear. So you don't want any curves in your, in your S-curve. In other words, this line needs to be nice and straight. You want it to be steep and you want it to be symmetrical. And... Uh, as you can see it's pretty close right now so uh, pretty close to what they're showing on the instructions so we'll go ahead and adjust adjust these settings but I have a feeling it's not going to do a whole lot for us so let's check it out okay so we'll adjust our first one and if you see when I move that it kind of kind of starts to tear in the middle so you can see that was pretty much right on where it needs to be the next adjustment you can see that kind of causes it to curve a little bit so we want that to be yeah, it's pretty close and the third one is going to need the least amount of adjustment because you roughed it in pretty good there so yeah that was right on and I by, by like I said by looking at it I could tell it was going to be um, so there you go that the discriminator is done so now we're going to move on and we're going to do uh, the next step okay we're now supposed to adjust our discriminator for minimum distortion and the factory spec on this says that it has to be less than 0.1% distortion. 
um, with one kilohertz fed in and they want 65 dBF going into the antenna ter terminals through a 300 ohm ballon. So if you look over here, our signal generator, we have 65 dBF. They want it at 90 megahertz. They want 100% uh, modulation at one kilohertz FM, which we did. And well, <laughs> here we are. I have not touched anything. Um, beautiful looking sine wave coming out of the receiver and going directly into the distortion meter just in case you're not getting it yes 0 0.03 0 0.07 percent distortion um, so it is fantastic then it says to go to narrow band and it should about double and you can see it does jumps around a little bit but it's staying in that 0.14 range so uh, and then back to I see no reason to align to adjust this and part of this is you're in order to go for minimum a lot uh, minimum distortion you're basically adjusting the same adjustments that we just did with our S curve and our uh, and our null point and everything. And since we had some pretty f relatively accurate test equipment, we were we were able to get it pretty much spot on. So, uh, really, if you want to recap what this procedure is, is you do the first portion of this alignment. Uh, to get it close and then you fine-tune it as you go along so um, as you can see I don't think this needs any fine-tuning we can play with it a little bit but I highly doubt that you're gonna see a whole lot and I guarantee you you're not going to hear any difference between 0 0.07 and 0 0.05 uh, distortion so this receiver is just working perfect so I think uh, we're gonna keep going on here and see how we do all right, for the next adjustment, they actually, there is an adjustment for the bias on the FETs for your RF front end. And what they want you to do is use a very sensitive uh, high impedance voltmeter, and they want you to measure the source on this FET, which is FET03 and FET02. And there's a pot for each one. There's a pot for FET02 and a pot for FET03 over here and they want you to adjust each one of those for exactly one volt so I've never seen one where you could adjust the bias on these so uh, again a very serious receiver so let's go over to our uh, 410C again since we have it out and uh, we'll make those adjustments so all I'm gonna do is measure right here and I'm gonna measure right over on this one here and I'm gonna just adjust those pots. So we'll look at the results here in a second. Okay, get you zoomed in. So here's our first one, and we're on the 1.5 volt scale. So one volt would be right about there. So we're at about 0.7 volts right now. So let me get I should have been a little more prepared. Let me get a tweaker. And let's see if we can adjust this. Oh yeah. And right there's one volt. So let's check the other one. And there we go. Spot on. Okay. So those are done. So let's move on. Okay, just for comparison's sakes, because I know you're going to ask, um, let's look at how that meter, that analog meter, compares to this digital military grade with fresh calibration uh, digital meter. 
So again, I set it for about roughly for that one volt. Not bad. Within two millivolts, we got it. And there's the other one. So uh, <laughs> if you have good a good analog meter, they can be very, very accurate. Um, it's just a matter of learning to read the scales on them, and the higher end meters will have more scales to them, so uh, or more ranges on the on the adjustment knob, but uh, they can be very, very accurate. So, uh, and again. You know, there's always the age-old argument, you know, I like seeing the needle move and, you know, for direction. And I kind of like that too, but I've gotten used to the digital meter because at work you can't carry these with you and all we use is, you know, calibrated digital meters. So uh, that's kind of, both of them are kind of second nature now to me. But again, if you have a, a good analog uh, VTVM or, or similar, analog meter there is no reason that you can't make very accurate adjustments with it so let's put this together and uh, keep moving on okay for the next adjustment they're going to have us adjust the, the accuracy of the signal strength meter and we're just going to adjust these two transformers here and then I believe there's a pot that you fine-tune it with when you're done but more importantly, uh, I get asked the same question over and over again. How do you connect the test equipment so it's accurate and you don't have loss? Well, you're never going to get perfect because anything you put between that signal generator and the device under test is going to have some kind of an insertion loss of some sort. But we can minimize it by using the correct cables and connectors and so forth, keeping our lead length short and uh, using some matching uh, devices. So what I've made up for for this, and and again, this is going. It's really not super necessary, but it helps. Um, I just have this little matching box that you can see over here, and on one side it has an output that's set to 75 ohms, and on the other side. It's 50 ohm input, and it's relatively okay between 88 and 108 megahertz, but it is its most accurate in that 90 to 98 megahertz range. It has the lowest amount of loss when, you, when it sees a 50 ohm impedance on the input and a 75 ohm load on the output. Um, now, again, my test equipment the output is always referenced to a 50 ohm load. So if I attach a 75 ohm load to it, it's going to affect it. So I'm using 50 ohm cable coming out. I go into my matching device. And by the way, the matching device is nothing but an L network. And you can look up online what an L network is, but it, it, this one is composed simply of a variable capacitor, like a little ceramic trimmer capacitor, and a coil of wire. And, uh, all right, I will show you because I know I will get questions. So this is all that's in there, and you can see um, it's just a couple of turns of, of stiff copper wire, and you can use any kind of a, it, this is about uh, three quarters of an inch in diameter. Um, you know, it's not not a big deal. Uh, it's two turns, one, two, you know, about two turns of wire. And you can, you'll have to tweak that and you can squeeze it together and pull it apart a little bit to align it. Um, I didn't have the exact range of trimmer capacitor I needed, so I just put this one uh, in kind of in parallel with it or, you know, to shunt some off. But uh, in a perfect world, if you had the right trimmer cap, and you have to experiment with it, um, it's only picofarads, so it's not real high. And then you put your, I, I used a 50 ohm dummy load terminator, just one of those little BNC terminators. Uh, let's see here. Don't know if I have one right handy. Let's see. Uh, 
There it is. So, you know, something that kind of looks like this, just a little 75 ohm terminator. I put that on the output. I attach a 50 ohm cable to my signal generator that I want to use this on. And then you basically adjust, you, you measure the output across your dummy load here and you adjust this for minimum loss so for maximum peak and in theory this will have very very little loss if you do it right um, one caveat to this is if you adjust this and then you put the put this back on it will throw everything off the capacitance of the box itself will affect it and if you move this too much it will affect it so once this is set you don't want to bend this or, or anything like that and you have to adjust it put the cover on test it adjust it you know it's very fussy you can drill a little hole in here if you want to um, I didn't but once you get it set this actually will have very low loss uh, but it will be at the frequency that you set it at so you have to remember if you want the most accuracy in the middle of your FM dial scale then you want to adjust this somewhere in that 90 to between 90 and 100 megahertz uh, to be roughly in the middle and that's where it'll be most uh, accurate as you go closer to 88 or 108 megahertz it'll start to have a little more loss on it and you have to keep that into consideration when you're using a device like this uh, there's also commercially available impedance matching that are low loss and you can buy them some of them are you know like from RF parts can be not super expensive um, some of them can be and they, they will have a set loss built into them across a very wide bandwidth and for instance they may have a 6 dB loss and all you do is subtract 6 dB from the signal or add 6 dB to your signal and that's what you want to dial into your signal generator and that will ensure that you get a pretty accurate output but anyhow enough about that <laughs> that's how I do it and this works for me so it seems to work pretty well so let's uh, again we're going to adjust those things with that signal strength and we're going to adjust our signal strength meter uh, the first adjustment is those two little I or that those little cans transformers and it says to adjust them for maximum peak on this signal strength meter. Hopefully you can see it well. I'm trying not to get so much glare on it. So let's adjust it. So here's our first one. And I'm looking around the camera. And you can see that's pretty much it was spot on. And how about this one? Let's look at it. Second one. Nope. Pretty much spot on. So those are the first two adjustments. Now let's check the second one. For the, for the next part of this, the second part of the meter alignment, we're going to adjust VR01 over there. And we're going to set the meter to be right at 100. So 100 is what they want for those conditions again we have 65 dBf at 90 megahertz and we're tuned right on center frequency everything is aligned ahead of time so now we should be able to adjust this and it should say 100 so you can see it's reading a little bit low right now so we're going to crank that up till it says 100 and there we are right there I got it on there I can't tell because I'm looking around the camera so let me get underneath here and look closely nope I'm over it I went over kind of hard to do this around a camera guys it really is let me zoom in for my own there we go how's that right about there We'll call that 100. Okay, so that is it. And the meter is now calibrated, and that's how you do it.
And you could see that was off a teeny little bit, but not bad. And there you go. So let's look at what we have next. Okay, Tony missed a step. Let's redo. <laughs> uh, I didn't check right here, but what they're saying is they wanted us to change the input signal strength from 65 to 100 dBF. So therefore, uh, I changed that. The meter was off the exact amount that I adjusted it. <laughs> so I brought it back down and it's now 100 dBF reads 100 on the meter. And uh, again, that also shows that my test equipment must be pretty accurate because it was right on. So either this was really accurate or my test equipment was very accurate or both. I don't know. But it's set now and it's correct. I, I stand corrected on that. Okay, for the next adjustment, they want us to set our tuning centering meter, and they want it to be when we're exactly on 90 megahertz, which we are, we want the tuning indicator to be centered, and it is. So there's no adjustment needed on this one. If it, if it were needed, there's another little uh, transformer that you would adjust the core of it and center up your meter, but it's this one's centered. It's spot on. So as we can see, the FM on this is very, very aligned. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to run into any problems on this, but um, so far the biggest one that was out was the narrow IF band adjustment, and it was just the tiniest little bit out. So not enough that I think it'll make any difference. So what we do know now is that so far this thing is working as advertised. So let's go and see what's next. All right, the very last part of the FM alignment involves doing the RF front end. And you have a series of capaci trimmer capacitors and a series of coils. And the capacitors have more influence at the higher end of the scale and the coils at the lower end of the scale in this case. And you go to a low scale, dial scale like 88 megahertz and then a higher dial scale uh, in this case, they want 98 megahertz, not full scale. And you go back and forth, back and forth, and you peak these all out using a combination of your looking at the output on the oscilloscope, which is your right like that, and looking at the signal strength meter and peaking it out with the meter. And it's very touchy and takes a long time, so I kind of <laughs> didn't want to bore you and make this video longer than, than it already is. But it's all peaked out now, and we're ready to actually listen to at least the mono FM. I have not done the, M the multiplex yet, but we'll do that here next. All right, <clears throat> we're going to start out with the multiplex, and this is going to be a really quick run through. It's actually a pretty simple process on this tuner. Um, first thing we're going to check is the VCO. And we're just going to adjust this plot here and check this test point here. And we just have a, a carrier signal only, 90 megahertz. We're tuned to 90 megahertz on the dial. And we're just going to make sure that uh, with that carrier signal, we're getting 76 kilohertz on our frequency counter, which, if you look, pretty darn good. Remember, this is a one-turn pot, so this isn't always dead-on perfect 76, but that's about as good as I can get it. It was a little bit low um, when I checked it, but it wasn't anything terrible, so it should be good. Um, next thing we're going to check is we're going to check for the, uh, the muting, which is no big deal. It's working fine, and we're going to look for the uh, pilot signal and... Uh, for our 19 kilohertz. We're going to check that out and uh, I'll show you that here in a second. Okay, we're now injecting right into the antenna input uh, a carrier signal with our 19 kilohertz pilot and I still have my stereo indicator light on so that's good and really all they want you to do is make an adjustment on VRO2 and TO1 over here to uh, for minimum signal output which Right now, I'm only seeing about 3 millivolts of output, which is pretty, pretty minimum. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll check it out, but I think it's good. It doesn't need adjusted. 
Hold on a second. Okay, so we're going to adjust this one and this one. And we'll go over to the voltmeter. And again, we're going to use the digital voltmeter this time. Why? Just because we can. All right. So, and I'll show you what it looks like. So if I adjust, it, it's pretty much right on now. But if I adjust this pot, you can see it climbs up. And if I go down, I should get in that 3 millivolt range. And then if I go through it, it'll start climbing back up again. And there it goes back up now. So I went right through it. So right about there, and it jumps around a lot, but right there is about your null point. Same thing with that little transformer, T01. We'll adjust that. And again, it was right on. And you can see I passed right through it. So right there is about it. So that's it. Um, that's all there is to that part. So our 19 kilohertz is set. Now we're going to go and uh, adjust for separation, stereo separation. So now we're going to add our stereo right and left channel tone. All right, so first thing I just discovered is the switch, the output switch on my SG-165 <laughs> uh, signal generator is noisy and has uh, must have gotten a little bit dirty and need, needs to come off the bench and get cleaned. But you, I don't know if you can see it on, this, on the picture or not, but all this kind of squiggliness up here and down through here, that is not normal um, and it's actually if I just wiggle the switch a little bit you can see just barely touching it uh, that switch is starting to get dirty so it doesn't hurt anything for what we're doing it it'll be just fine so next thing we're gonna do now is I'm gonna go to just look at the left channel and then the right channel so there's left there's right and the whole idea now is we're going to, they both suppress just perfectly, but we're going to adjust VR06, which is the separation adjustment. And you just want this line to be as straight and flat as possible, which it, as you can see, it already is. Um, I'll show you what it looks like when we adjust it. Do you see how it's starting to get curvature to it? And see, I go the other way, it gets curvature the other way. And the idea is to make it totally as flat as possible. Right like that. Now that line would be dead straight if it weren't for the noise <laughs> that my signal generator's producing from the dirty switch. But that's okay. We'll get that fixed. Um, yeah, we'll get that fixed. The cobbler's kids always go barefoot, as they say, huh? So anyways, uh, there you go. That's done. Now if we switch over... To the other and of course it's not syncing up because I don't have it set to sync to that channel but you can see this one's nice and flat as well so our FM stereo is pretty much that's really all there is to it there's a couple little other small adjustments for the auto noise filter and uh, and to set the uh, calibration tone um, but other than that that is all there is to the multiplex on this one it's very simple um, can't ask for anything easier than that. So what we're going to do right now, um, we tested the tuner out and obviously it's working really, really well on FM. And this video has gotten pretty epic length already, I'm pretty sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this video right now as it stands and I'm going to upload it to you all. And then uh, this will be part one. And when we come to part two, uh, we'll we're going to tackle the AM section, which is really going to be the interesting part of this, I think. At least for me, it will be personally. And a uh, couple little minor little repair things. The dial indicator lights on the FM section, um, or I mean the meter, the meter lights, the back lights for the meters, are burned out on the FM side. And while we're in there, we'll replace both the FM and the AM lights with LEDs. Um, they each only use a single light bulb, so that should be a real simple thing to fix. Um, and I'll just show you that real quick. If you look down inside here, there's the bulb. 
and it just pulls out and we'll replace that and that'll be good as new so uh, thank you all for uh, watching and coming along for the ride here this has really definitely been a little bit different of a tuner than anything I've ever worked on I will tell you all the tuners I've done lately I'm starting to get a little bit of tuner burnout and believe it or not I have three more of them <laughs> that need repaired but I don't know if I'll do those right after we finish this project maybe I'll do a couple other things just to break it up a little bit just for my own sanity if nothing else uh, so again thank you all for coming along uh, those of you who have made donations and there were quite a few of you recently I truly appreciate it and I promise you all that I'll try to keep the good videos coming as much as I have time to do so and that I promise you that I will only use that money for things for our, for projects for the bench um, and then for the you know for the bench towards the channel and uh, I thank you all I really do I appreciate all that you do it's one of the reasons that I enjoy doing this and sharing it with you guys so as always peace joy happiness and good health in all your lives and until next time stay well and we'll be with you soon with part two take care bye bye